had to make a quick correction. He didn't read the copyright. I'm the second best TypeScript YouTuber. Just wanted to clarify. I'm not going to steal valor from Matt Pelcock. He is very good at what he does. But for those who don't know me, I'm Theo. I've been doing software dev videos for about two years now. And uh, who's watched one of my videos before? Yeah. Decent number, y'all. Good stuff. I don't know why. <laughs> So I'm giving my talk today about streaming, and not just in React, but as a whole, why it's cool and the benefits of adding streaming to your applications. And I'm doing that first and foremost by showing you a normal React app written the way many of us have written it before. I just refresh the page, we see the loading, and we have our signed in state. We've all hopefully written code like this before. Maybe not, actually. Let's see who's written code like this before. Let's see hands. I can't actually see the hands because I literally just have a black box here, but I trust there's a decent number of them. If you've written code like this, move to React Query. Anyways, this code works fine. The page loads, it has a JavaScript tag in it, the browser loads the JavaScript tag, the JavaScript parses, renders the component, realizes, oh, I need to go fetch this data. And it then goes and makes the API request, gets the data, sets it as state, and then re-renders with the new updated state. There are a couple problems here, though. Obviously, there are race conditions and whatnot. We're going to ignore those. The main problem is that I have to wait until the page has loaded the HTML, fetch the JavaScript, parse the JavaScript, run the JavaScript, render the component, and then we can finally start the fetch when we could have been doing all of that work during that time before. How, though? Because we need to have this content on the page. We can't just send some HTML and send the rest later. Or can we? There is this wonderful little demo that Guillermo tweeted a while back. I was going to copy paste the code, but we've all used uh, like screen capture of text before. It doesn't work, and I didn't feel like coding it out. The important details here are that we have a stream. We write this stream data writable with this wait until, but we immediately send a response that has the content type of HTML. We then, in this stream data function, create a writer, immediately write a little bit of HTML, wait for 1.5 seconds, then we fetch this confetti URL and show you the rest after. And what this looks like, if I go load this page, it says hello, and then the world comes up. Where things get interesting is if we hop in the network tab and we do the same thing, you might have noticed here, it's going to be hard to see, so I actually copy the code so we can go take a look in a second. The HTML comes in. Oh, I need to turn off the caching there. Reload this. The HTML comes in partially complete. It stops here, and then the rest of the HTML comes in after. Pretty cool. The way that this works is the browser is smart enough to render incomplete HTML as long as it has a closing tag for the most recent element. You can just send incomplete HTML, the browser can render it, and you can finish the HTML later. That's great if you have, or that's great if you have your content all in order. We'll get to the out of order part in a minute. So here I have the modern server component version of this code. I get the user from database directly. This code is very sophisticated, as we can see here. I wait for three seconds and then return a fake user. But when I load this, if I close and reopen that page, I'm sitting here waiting. You see the little loading indicator on top? You have to wait for the whole three seconds before you see anything. And what I found as a developer and as a user is that most people will perceive this website as way slower than a website that loads all the JavaScript up front because you can see something immediately. If you go to a web page that has the HTML cached on a CDN so you can get that part instantaneously, it makes navigation feel faster, even if you're just seeing a loading spinner immediately afterwards. That's why we put up with single page app quirks and behaviors for as long as we did, because we would get that immediate response, wait for the JS to load, have it in our cache, and then everything else is fast enough. But the most important thing is you would click a button and immediately see the response, which if I close and reopen this, I'm not immediately seeing a response. This is taking some serious time. So how do we solve this? Who knows the modern solution to this problem in the audience? Let's see hands. I still can't see hands. How about people shout out, what's the solution to this problem? What's the component I need to add to fix this? Correct. 
I need to move this part out really quick, which we can do easily. A function, user, data. Grab that, just make this async, then return. Let's see if a uh, cursor can carry me here. Cool, it can. And we swap this over. Error user is not defined. Oh, because it was the old state. Because in this funny, you even get the same issues when you're debugging because it took three seconds to leave the error state page to get to the actual working page again. So I just thought my code was wrong when in reality the browser was late. And now all we have to do is wrap this with a suspense. Fallback is loading. Forgot to import it. And now we get that loading state immediately. And if I close and reopen, we see that. But we also see the loading indicator because the browser hasn't finished sending the HTML yet. If I again open the network tab and refresh this, we hop over here, you'll see this is an incomplete HTML tag. I can prove that by adding a zero. Clear this, reload. And now you'll see we have this incomplete HTML. It hasn't finished pushing. But in just a moment, it's going to push the rest of the HTML. I should probably have made it not 30 seconds. Let's make it five. Gives me enough time to quickly maneuver my way through DevTools. This is obnoxious to demo, I've learned quickly, because you have to get into DevTools before the rest comes in. And then it resets you to the top so you don't see where you were scrolled. That's weird. Why is this div hidden? Well, if your HTML isn't in order of fastest to slowest, it turns out streaming isn't particularly useful. Because if, let's say, instead of the sign-in state being below the static content, this was above, we can't just send that part later because it's in the order. HTML is a linear format. We could do some CSS hacks to swap things around. I have unironically seen code like that before. It is terrifying. But what if we didn't have to? What if the order things were streamed to the browser didn't have to perfectly match the order that they appeared in the HTML and then eventually the DOM the way the user would see it? This has been a challenge that we've been trying to figure out a good, reliable solution for, for us streaming nerds for a while. And I've DIY'd some stupid stuff before on Cloudflare. I hope none of you have had to do that. It was not fun. But there's some magic JavaScript in here that makes this all work. And I could show you how it works, but I think it's more fun to show you how it breaks. So we're going to open up this version of the page that has a couple additional pieces. Unhidden. So now we have these three slow components. Slow component one, then two, then three. Again, very complex code. I pass them a prop that is the timeout for how long they're supposed to be. Also, should have mentioned this before, all this code is server code. None of the JavaScript you're seeing here gets shipped to the client. If I had to use client on top, it would just break entirely because they're async components. But here we have the one, then the two, then the three. And I can also change the order of these. I could do three, two, one, and they'll pop in bottom, middle, top. So clearly this isn't coming through linearly. Let's break it. I could have written this code live, but it looks like this, so I'm not going to. <laughs> We're going to hop to the hidden version quick. And now we see one, then two, then dollar sign slow component three. Huh? Let's take a look at the dev tools. So if we hop in here, I refresh again, clear and refresh once more. You'll see the HTML is coming in here. And we have all my divs, loading states. But we also have this important piece here, this script tag. I have spent far too much time thinking about this particular script tag and teaching people who work on other things like Elixir the importance of this script tag. Can I uh, hi, tell this that this is JavaScript, even if it doesn't want to believe it? Cool. This is a magic function that gets sent the first time Next.js streams additional HTML to the browser. It grabs an element by ID, or this, it defines this RC function, which takes an element by its ID. It removes the child. So this is removing itself, because it goes to the parent, then removes it. We find this element B, and we do a bunch of wonderful code to swap these out and change this element for this other element. And then we have right here, dollar sign $RC, B colon 0, comma, S colon 0. If I go back to this, 
I'll change this to be five, so it's, or six, sure, so it's a bit slower. Hide these guys. And change this to be zero. We'll reload here. And you'll see somewhat what's happening here. We wait the six-ish seconds, and we get the fake div being replaced. Because what would have existed in the HTML before, which is actually relatively easy to show, is in this HTML, come on. I don't know why this is guess like that. There we go. In this HTML, where that loading state is, we have template ID B0. And that's how the HTML knows where this element needs to be swapped. So when you put in a suspense using server components, React will put in one of these templates for each of those points and identify them in the order that they were created. And then when React finishes resolving that suspense boundary and knows this data is done, it sends that HTML with an ID, S colon, some number, to swap it. So the order that these things come in is we get the HTML that doesn't have anything wrapping it in suspense. We then, once one of these suspense boundaries is resolved and ready, we send in this hidden div that has the, new ID, or that has the ID to match to this other element, contains the actual HTML within it. And then if we haven't sent this RC script tag yet, we send that immediately afterwards with this function, and then it invocates itself to swap those elements. This allows us to send the HTML in any order and swap it at any point. And this doesn't just benefit React, and doesn't just benefit JavaScript. I've been helping the Phoenix Live View team in the Elixir world in implementing this over there so they can send their template, they can send their layout immediately, and then send the rest of the data after any database calls or authentication or other things are done, which will make your site feel way faster, especially if you can cache that first part on a CDN and then resolve the rest as you go. And if we hop back in here quick and I turn these all back on, clear that, where things get really optimized and, in my opinion, really interesting, is once, or once you've sent this first chunk with this first HTML, the rest can just be sent without that script tag, and it just calls like that. So for S2, because that came in next, it sends the HTML, then it sends the script tag with this data, and then it sends, since we're in Next.js, the metadata necessary for Next to keep track of what's in the DOM where, handle hydration, all of those things. And we have the third one come in, and it does the exact same thing. I think this is super cool, and the patterns that it enables are phenomenal. I'm going to take a risk and go a step further, though, because I have more time left than I thought I would at this point. So we're going to do something really dumb. We're going to install Next Canary. Not that I'm not already on a Canary, but we're not on the latest. And we're going to turn on Experimental. And look at that. What we've just done is made it so this is now a default behavior, which allows for that wonderful caching behavior I was describing before. So if we hop back, uh, yeah, we have page home. This should just work, hopefully, if all goes well. Awesome. What I just turned on is a really cool new feature called dynamic IO. Previously, you would have had to tell React or Next.js or whatever set of tools you're using, where these boundaries exist by using a suspense tag. But now, I can delete the async here because I don't really need that anymore. And we have the suspense. I can leave that in. Now, if we were to build this project, we get very different output assets. Because the biggest issue with streaming is that first byte has to be resolved by the same server that sends the rest. So if I'm going to a web page and it's being served with server components, I can't get something from a CDN immediately. I need to have a connection with that server so it can send down everything else. This is nice because you have that one source of truth that provides all of the content for the page. It allows you to send some data ahead of time. Even if your site is entirely dynamic, you can at least start loading the script tags, the fonts, the CSS, and all of those things earlier but you're still blocked on a server. If you're using Lambda, something like that, it has to spin up. 
process the request, figure out what response to start sending, start sending it, start generating the rest, and it sends it all down. But if I bun, run, build after turning on dynamic I.O., we get a nice little error. Oh, because I still have a bunch of those force dynamic tags, which are no longer needed, which is a really cool change. Hopefully that's enough, or do I have one in hidden as well? I do. And of course, things are no longer being used. Fifth time's the charm. Da -da -da. There we are. What we have done here that is super cool, you'll see that half and half circle. This page is partially pre-rendered. So you have pre-rendering, which is generating HTML based on what props you expect a page to have. You have dynamic rendering, which is the whole page is rendered dynamically on the fly. But now we have partial pre-rendering, where we take everything up until the first suspense tag, statically render that, and store it in a CDN. And now when the user goes to the page, that part can load immediately. They can start seeing something. It could be a loading state. It could be a blank white page. But at least they're already loading the fonts, the CSS, and all those other things as your server spins up and starts generating the rest. How does that work, though? There must be some crazy compiler hacks, right? I have a video coming out soon that I'm really proud of about the magic powering this feature and how it enables all of these things. But the TLDR is the main flag that they're using to identify what can or can't be rendered this way. It's async. We're already painting the code. We're already telling whatever tools we're using what is or isn't async, which means, theoretically, that means there's some work that has to be done there. So now we know where this work starts, because an async function was called. And we even gave them an extra hint. We added a suspense tag. Now everything that's needed to render that static part is ready to go. We can render it, save it in a CDN. And then going forward, everything can be rendered on the server. It just eats that initial HTML and then streams down the rest with the magic little hot swapping we saw with that RC function. I hope this helps clarify both why the streaming stuff is so important and how it actually works and how React has worked around the limitations of the protocol. Because it turns out streaming HTML in order doesn't really get you a great experience for your users. With a little bit of JavaScript, moving a few elements around here and there, all of a sudden this pattern becomes a better way to browse the web. Thank you all.